Good morning. I'm Josiah Kroom, and we're so glad you chose to worship with us this morning. Are you here for the first time? Have you been attending for several months or maybe even years? Whatever the case, we're glad you're here and we love to connect with you. In the back of the chair in front of you, you'll find a connection card. We encourage you to fill it out each week and let us know you're here. Cards may be placed in the offering boxes in the lobby following the service. Now, here's what's coming up for you and your family. First off, our congregational meeting is today, immediately following the late worship service. Next, parents of elementary kids. If you are looking for a place for your child to hang out this summer, we encourage you to check out Calvary Kids Summer Club. Registration opens this Wednesday, March 1st. So watch the website to download the form or stop by the office on Wednesday. Also men, we'd love to see you at our men's prayer breakfast this Saturday, March 4th at 8 a.m. Join us for good food and fellowship, as well as a time of prayer. Well, we are still very much in winter mode here in South Dakota. Summer really is just around the corner, and we are so excited about the camp opportunities for our students. Pursuit youth are encouraged to check out our Converge camps this summer. High school camp will be June 18th to the 23rd, and middle school camp is July 30th through August 4th. We want to invest in your students, so to help you cover the cost of camp, we are offering $100 scholarships for Converge Camps while supplies last. Registration is available on the Heartland Converge website, and you can reach out to Pastor Aaron for more questions. The whole Calvary family, as well as friends and neighbors from our community, are invited to join us on Saturday, March 11th, between 9 a.m. and noon for a waffle feed fundraiser. This all-you-can-eat meal by Dad's Belgian Waffles includes waffles, toppings, sausage, juice, coffee, and milk. Tickets are $10, kids five and under eat free, and all proceeds go to the Pursuit 2023 missions trip to Puerto Rico. Carryout is also available. Tickets are available at the door or in advance at the Calvary office. Lastly, the new March edition of our monthly newsletter, The Connecting Point, is now available in the lobby. Be sure to pick up a copy today for more information about the ministries and special events we have coming up this month. Thanks for joining us today. Our host team will be available at the welcome kiosk following the service. And be sure to stop by the counter in the lobby to register for upcoming events. Now, please stand as we continue in worship. Good morning, welcome to Calvary. It's so good to have you here this morning as we enter this time of worship through song, through scripture, through the message. And as we chase after those lions that we've identified, know that there's nothing that our God cannot do. Just one word, and you calm the storm surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch. My eyes were open to see, my heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that he can't move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. Just one word. You heal what's broken inside me. Just takes a word, and just one word, and you revive every dream. And just one touch, I feel the power of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes were to see my heart can't help but believe there's nothing that our God can't do there's not a mountain that he can move oh praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that our God can't do oh I believe there's nothing that our God can't do there's not a prison wall he can't Praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. Oh. I 
will believe for greater things there's no power like the power of jesus let faith arise let all agree there's no power like the power of jesus i will believe for greater things there's no power like the power of jesus let faith arise let all agree there's no power like the power of jesus i will believe for greater things there's no power like the power of jesus let faith arise let all agree there's no power like his power there's nothing that our god can't do there's not a mountain that Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. Oh, there's nothing that our God can do. There's not a prison wall we can't break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God that we can see him demonstrate on our behalf when we come up against those difficult times, that we can see his victory through that power. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph My God will never fail No, my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord oh. there's power in the mighty name of Jesus Every war he wages, he will win. Oh, I'm not backing down from any giant. Because I know how this story ends. Yes, I know how this story ends. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to worship my way through. I'm going to worship my What the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good.
good. You turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Oh, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn. It the enemy means for evil and you turn it for good that's the God we serve that's the God we love that's the God who loves us and cares about us he can take anything that we face and he can turn it to our good and that's why we worship him that's why we set aside time in our service to think about our worship of him because that's what our giving is it is about worship of who Jesus is of who God is a God that loves us so much that we're going to see victory. And so when we come to this part in our service, if you're, if you're new to Calvary, we don't pass a plate to hand out or to take offering with. You can give online. You can text to give. You can give through the mail in the boxes out in the foyer. The giving action isn't what's important. It's the purpose and the reason behind it. And are we worshiping God? And so... I just ask and challenge you as we go to prayer that you would be praying, what is it, God, that I can give? Whether it's my finances, whether it's my time, whether it's the resources that I have available to me, how can I worship you with what you've given me? So please bow your heads and pray with me. God, thank you. Thank you for being a God who can take whatever comes our way, whether it feels like it's horrible, miserable, but you can turn it to our good for your purposes. The promise that you give us rings true. I thank you, God, for the opportunity that we have to be in this room, to worship you, to hear from you. I thank you for the ministries that that you've provided this church to be a part of. I think of the kids' ministry and student ministries today and throughout this week on Wednesday, our community groups, whether they meet here or in homes, Lord, I pray that all of those would accomplish the mission that you've given Calvary of building up, but not just to build up, building up so that we can reach out, God, so that we can be a light in our community. I pray, Lord, that we would be able to do that throughout our our local community, out across this country, Lord. I thank you for our country and the fact that it gives us the freedom to meet like this. 
Help us to be a gospel. Help us to be the gospel so that people see and there's a light that goes out throughout this country. Lord, I thank you so much for those that you've provided that we get the chance to support across this globe. Our missionaries who who are out there serving in places, some of them some tough places, I think specifically today of our, our sister churches in the Ukraine. Got some, got some good news that they've got electricity right now, Lord, and we praise you for that. As that can be such an encouragement to them, Lord, but we also know that, that one of our pastors is, is right up close to the front lines as he ministers to churches that need help, that need your encouragement, Lord, to flow through him, Lord. Help us be an encouragement to them so that they can be an encouragement to others. They can be your gospel in a very dark place right now. Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity that you do give us to worship you, not just in song and through hearing your word, Lord, but we can worship you with our giving. And I pray, God, that you would lay it on our hearts, that whatever it is that you would want us to give, that we would do so, that we would answer that call, that we would listen, whether it be our our finances or whether it, it be our time or the resources that we have, Lord, We just pray that they would be used by you in a way that affects change in our hearts as we give and in the hearts of those who are affected by that giving. We love you and we worship you. It is in your son's precious and holy name, the name of Jesus, that we pray these things. Amen.
so much for singing with us. You can have a seat. Good morning. That's what it's about, right? That's why we're doing the series that we're doing is to turn our eyes upon Jesus, to learn to rely on Jesus. And whatever we face, whatever we go against, it's about Jesus and turning our eyes towards him. And so as we step into this, this is a a series that we've been talking about doing, and it's about our Lenten series. It's about stepping into what Jesus wants us. It's not about us, it's about him, right? And so as we look at this and we see this tesserocosta, which means 40 days, which is the Greek word that was used for Lent series, It comes from Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. That word 40 is a big number in Scripture. It gets used a lot throughout Scripture, but never more prevalent. I was like, whoa, I thought maybe you guys were going to go to sleep on me there for a minute. (laughs) These 40 days, it's important, right? And so we're going to start ours this Tuesday. Now, I heard there was some confusion that maybe you thought we were starting last Tuesday. In fact, somebody texted me and said, listen, I started last Tuesday. Does that mean I can take a week off in the middle? No. Starts this Tuesday, okay? And we're going to go straight 40 days. Uh, A lot of uh, people who practice Lent, they will actually start last Wednesday, which was Ash Wednesday, and it's because they... They don't take Sundays, and they, they, give, they uh, take Sundays off. Well, we're, we're going straight through, 40 days, all right? And we're going to do this. In fact, we've got something really cool planned for you. I want to tell you about it. We have 40 days worth of devotionals that have been recorded by our staff. And we're going to start on Tuesday, and they'll be on Instagram, they'll be on Facebook, and they'll be on the website. They're not real long. They're about two to three minutes. It's just something that we can do as a church together to study God's Word, to start and look at relying more on Jesus as we go towards Easter. And so I want to encourage you, please, let's do this as a staff. Some point throughout that day, do the devotional, follow it. Look at it, listen to it on Facebook, Instagram, or the website. If you're on Facebook or Instagram, comment on it, and then share it. And so as we go out and we go through a church together, studying God's Word together, and just focusing, and then use that two to three minutes maybe to just lead into your own prayer life. 
There's a short little prayer at the end of each one, but use it to lead into your own prayer life as we look at trying to rely more on Jesus. And so as we give up something, and we're going to be talking a lot, a lot more about that today, but as we give up something, we want to make sure that we do it for the right reasons. It's not about, look at me, see what I'm doing. It's about, it's about learning to trust and rely more on Jesus. Last week, we examined our motivation. Why are we going to do this? And the fact that Jesus spoke to that very thing in the Sermon on the Mount, and that he was talking about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, and how they cared more about the external than they did the internal, the heart. They cared more about what people saw they were doing than about their heart and why they were doing it. And so we looked at that word hypocrite and that it ultimately came from two Greek words that were put together, which literally meant interpreted from underneath and meaning that that's what they wore masks in their drama and they would interpret things and who they were and they would wear these masks so that people didn't know who they were. They wanted people to see who they wanted to be, not necessarily who they were. And then we learned from Paul as he wrote to the Corinthians that for us to truly follow Jesus, for us to truly rely on Jesus, it is about our heart. It's about having a sincere love. And that that word sincere is literally the antithesis of hypocrisy. It means without hypocrisy. And so we need to drop the masks and not try to be puffed up, not try to rely on who we are, but to rely on Jesus. And so today, we're going to look at the ultimate example that we could possibly have on what it means to trust in and to stand up and to rely on God when we face the things that come our way. And we're going to use, actually, the verses that we're lying, relying the whole series on, starting in Matthew chapter 4, and it's Jesus' experience in the wilderness. Listen as I read from chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. During that time the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No. The scriptures say, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, if you are the son of God, jump off, for the scriptures say, he will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up and their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him, for the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil went away and angels came and took care of Jesus. So we see Jesus is facing Temptations, he's facing testings in his life here, right? And there's three of them. And so we're going to kind of just pull those three apart and see what we can learn from what Jesus faced and how we can face them. The first one, verse 3, during that time the devil came and said to him, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. Well, remember, Jesus has been out there 40 days and he hasn't eaten anything. Think about if you had gone 40 days without food. First of all, they, the doctors would tell you that's the limit. Like, that's when people's organs start shutting down if you go 40 days without any nutrients. And so think about how, I, I don't know about you, but you get that nice warm loaf of bread that smells so amazing. I, don't, I, I could have just eaten 30 seconds ago, and I want to eat that, right? 40 days. And so Satan is testing Jesus and saying, make some bread. You can do that, right? And what's he testing there? He's testing Jesus' humanity. The fact that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And you know how important that is for us to recognize and realize? We have to understand that it is so important because he can understand our suffering because he was fully man. He was hungry. Yes, he's God, but he was a human. 
40 days without food. He was hungry. And it shows that Jesus truly can understand what we go through when we face times where we're tested, where maybe we're tempted. It also speaks to his perfect life because that perfect life is so important. That's why he could go to the cross. That's why he could give his life on the cross for us is because he lived a perfect life. That's why we can trust in him to bring us into the eternal presence of God because he lived as a human a perfect life. And so as Jesus is tested in his humanity, it means much to us that we should grasp and understand that. He ultimately responds to this, and it shows us that we can truly rely on God for our sustenance, for our vitality, for our satisfaction, physical, emotional, and spiritual. We can trust God to provide, but it takes trust. I, I, don't, I may have told you this story, but when we were first in ministry at a church, it was as a, a kid's ministry director, and it was kind of like a part-time salary for, with a full-time job, and so we didn't make a lot, and there were times we never were close to starvation, okay, so I'm not, I'm not out there telling you that we were going to die any moment, okay, but there were times where we looked, and the refrigerator was empty, and the cupboards were kind of empty, and we're like, okay, not getting paid for a couple more days, not sure what we're going to do here, and you know, and, and you, we pray about it, and you know what? There was one time where it was, things were empty, and we were like, I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to do something. I just don't know what it is yet. And, and the house we lived in, we went in and, out, in and out the side door. We didn't go out the front door very often. But we opened the front door, and there were five bags of groceries sitting right in front of the front door for us. No clue who brought them, no clue how they got there. I just know that was God providing, because God will provide if you trust and you have faith in him. And I love this temptation, this temptation of Jesus' humanity, because it shows us that we can trust the creator instead of the creation. We can lean into him. The second temptation finds Satan taking scripture totally out of context, which is, is something that happens quite often in our culture today. There are so many people, some that, that would claim to be pastors that are saying, this is what Scripture's saying so that they can live this lifestyle. And that's wrong. As we take it out of context and we use it in ways that that is not how Scripture was intended, we have to be very careful that we handle God's word well. Listen, the devil took him to the holy city of Jerusalem at the highest point, and he said, if you are the Son of God, jump off for the Scriptures, say, he will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. That is true. That is scripture. That is literal scripture that he's quoting right there. But he's using it out of context to try to tempt Jesus to get out of what he's doing so that he can move on from his temptation and his trials. And so he's taking scripture totally out of context. What we can learn here is we need to handle the word of God correctly. I will be honest, it's something that I pray about all the time. The beginning of the week when I start looking at the sermon and putting the sermon together, it's one of the first things that I pray. Help me, Lord, not to, to mess this up. Help me, Lord, to say your words the way you want your words to be said because it is so important that we look at Scripture and we look at it in the context that it comes. You know, there's a verse that we use that speaks so much to it. We use it Every week here, well, all right, not every week because the weather has not been permitting, but on Wednesday nights, we have Awana, right? And the verse, the theme verse for Awana speaks directly to this. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. Some... some Translations will say, rightly handles the word of truth. 
If you look at that verse, and like we just talked about, and look at it in context, you look at as Paul's writing to Timothy, at this time, he actually, at the beginning of that chapter, he actually speaks to, like for instance, in verse 3, he talks about soldiers. In verse 5, he talks about athletes. In verse 6, he talks about the farmer. And then he, he translates it into the worker in verse 15. Who's he talking to there? The average person, right? The everyday Joe, so to speak. He's talking about them, and as they hear the word of God, and as you speak the word of God to them, and you talk about the word of God to them, you have to do it right. And the problem was, if you look at verse 14 and 16, the one that's sandwiched around verse 15, it's actually talking about the fact that they aren't handling the word of God. They have vain discussions. They speak uh, just whatever they want, and they twist the truth. In fact, earlier in the first letter that he wrote to Timothy, in verse, chapter 1, verse 6, it says, but some people have missed the whole point. They have turned away from these things and spend their time in meaningless discussions. This is what he's talking about when we rightly handle the word of God, when we correctly speak the word of truth. He's talking about the gospel and how important it is for us to get it right, to share it in context, to not take it out of context like Satan did trying to tempt Jesus. We need to always be aware of what the original context, the original intent that the writers were using as we look at and we take the scriptures apart. The third temptation that Jesus faced It's a juxtaposition, a juxtaposition between the way of the cross and the way of power, the way of the kingdom versus the way of the world. Verse 8 says, next, the devil took him to peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Here it is. Here's your chance. You can get out all of this. You can stop all of this pain. Just kneel down and worship me. That's the way of the world, right? That's what the world teaches us as we step into things that maybe we desire, the things that we want, the things that culture is saying, this is what you need, and you need to go after this. Are we going to shoot for that? Or are we going to shoot for what God is calling us to, which might be a little more difficult path? It might be a harder path to step into. When we look at what Jesus did, as we see it, there's, we can see a temptation and the testing that's coming, right? Well, a lot of times a temptation or a test that comes our way, it's kind of like a shortcut, right? A shortcut for us to get what we think we need or what we want or what we desire. You know, I... I Before I was in the the ministry as a pastor, I told you I I worked at a Bible conference. I worked at Harvey Cedars Bible Conference in New Jersey, and I oversaw the summer staff. There was about 60 kids there that took care of the the dining room. They took care of cooking the food. They took care of the housekeeping. They took care of maintenance. And so we oversaw that whole staff, my wife and I, um, for the summer. One summer, one summer, About 10 of them decided they were going to take the shortcut. At the end of of each week, when the guests were there, there would be a jar in the center of the table, and it was tips for all the employees, all of the summer staff, everyone, not just the servers, and it would get divided up at the end of the week amongst all of those that were serving on the summer staff. Well, 10 of them decided throughout the summer that that they were going to take a shortcut to get what they wanted. Whether, and, you know, some of, them, some of them were going on to college at Philadelphia Biblical University, and they were raising money in the summer to pay for that. That's a worthy cause, right? That's a good thing. But the temptation there in front of them was, I need that now. I'm not going to trust God. I'm not going to rely on God to provide for my needs. I need that now. And they would reach their hands in the jar, and they would take a bunch of it out and keep it for themselves. They were tempted, but then they succumbed to that temptation. The temptation, the sin was not the temptation. The sin wasn't looking at the jar and going, I maybe could have some of that. That would be good to have. No, the sin was when they put their hand in the jar and they pulled it out. 
that was the sin. And when we take the shortcut, when we step into that temptation and we fall into that temptation, it hurts us. It does not help us. It doesn't matter that, that maybe it was a good reason why they needed it. Maybe they were really poor and they didn't have any money and they were going to, to study the Bible so they needed the money. No, it does not matter. That is not the key. The key is, is that the fact that it hurt them because all 10 of them were asked to leave. When we step into temptation, the moment, you know, for four or five weeks there, things are good. They were having cash. They were either having cash to spend or their savings was going up. But then they lost their job because they stepped into the temptation. They didn't fight it. They didn't follow the beautiful picture that Jesus gives us in how to face the tests that we face. How does Jesus do it? Well, each one of those temptations, what's he do? He throws scripture at it. He takes the word of God and he puts it in Satan's ace and says, no, not doing this. Verse four, but Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He's quoting Deuteronomy chapter eight, verse three. The second temptation, he responds, Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. It's Deuteronomy chapter six, verse 16. And the third temptation, he finally says, get out of here, Satan. Jesus told him, for the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. He takes the time that he faces, he takes the tests, the trials, the temptations that he comes up against, and the first thing out of his mouth is no. Here's scripture to tell you, tell you I don't need this. This is wrong. Jesus gives us the very best battle plan we could possibly have. Scripture. God's word. Handling it correctly. And when we face the things that are coming our way, the tests and the trials that are coming our way, we throw scripture at it. Think about it like this. Think about it, you know, um, I don't remember if we ever had these. I don't feel like we did, but I know my daughter has brought these home where they, they, they have these tests, right, at home. It's an open book test at home. So that you get the test and you have the questions and you have the book right there in front of you and you can open the book and you can page through it and you read. I feel like they called that homework when I went to school. But this is an open book test, right? Well, those tests are easy, right? I mean, you, it'd be pretty hard to totally mess that test up. You got the book, you got all the answers, you got all the time in the world to find the answers. But then think about the tests that happen at school that aren't that. They're the closed book tests that when you walk into the room, you got your pen or your pencil, you sit down and you got the test and you got to do it. And you got to have the answers ready to go. That's the way life is. Life is a closed book test. And for us to be able to face the tests and the trials that we go up against, we need scripture in our hearts and in our heads to be able to throw it at it, to be able to stop it, to face the tests and the temptations and the trials that come our way. You know, God is not the one who tempts us, but he does allow it. Think about Job, <laughs> what he was allowed to have happen to him. As we step into it, we understand that the testing that we get, the tests that we face, the trials that we come against, they are something that will help us. That's why in James chapter 1, it says this in verse 2, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Tests, trials. If we have scripture in our hearts, in our heads, it gives us the opportunity to stand up against them. And, and this season of Lent, 
This is what I think is so cool about this, and I love stepping into it, even though it's not traditionally something that a Baptist church would do, right? As we step into this season of Lent, we are voluntarily saying to God, yes, I want to be tested. I want to be tempted. We are voluntarily saying that. How cool is that? Some of you might be going, no, crazy is that. <laughs> but that's why we give up something for Lent. And it's got to be something that you give up, that it's something that you desire all the time, something that on a daily basis you want to go to. I've heard, you know, some people, they're addicted to playing games on their phone. So they're giving that up. I've heard, you know, some people, it's certain, um, you know, last year it was peanut M&Ms for me, right? Well, I'm going to tell you what I give up, and I'm telling you what I'm giving up this year, not so that you can say, ooh, that's amazing, not so you can say, oh, that's really cool, but I want you to understand how important it is and how serious I think it is, right? And I'm not asking you to tell everybody what you're giving up. I'm just sharing it to you to give you an idea of maybe what you can do. If you know me very well, in fact, I think I told you the other day, the other Sunday, that, that my GPS now when I get in the car in the morning doesn't say it's four minutes to work. It says four minutes to high V because that's where Starbucks is. And so, yeah, I'm going to give up Starbucks. And no, I'm not going to go to Scooters or Muddy Moe's in place of it. You may want to sell your stock in Starbucks before Tuesday because I feel like it's going to hurt them. But seriously, now, when that desire hits for me to go to Starbucks, which I'm going to tell you, it's going to hit a lot. I've decided, and I'm going to challenge you to do something, and I want you to do it with me. If you're going to give up something, I want you to memorize some scripture. I know some of you are out there, I don't, can't memorize scripture. I get it. I understand. It's not easy sometimes when your brain is like my brain. It, it starts to fade, right? But you can do it. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Memorize it. And if you're like me, I've memorized it a couple of times, once in the King James, once in the ESV. Now I'm reading it from the NLT, so I'm completely messed up in my brain. I'm not worried if you get it word for word, but get it, understand it, know it. Understand that, that we should count it joy. That, that part where it says troubled in James, it's the same root word that is used back in Matthew when Jesus is tempted. Literally the same word. And so as we look at that, and we trust and understand Jesus went through this, he used scripture against it, we're going to go through this, we need to use scripture again, it, let's count it joy when we get into these tests, because that testing is going to grow our faith, and when our faith grows, we're going to be able to endure, and when we endure, we're going to be made complete. Think of how awesome that would feel. That's what this giving something up for Lent is about. It is about truly understanding and relying on who Jesus is to us. Relying on what Jesus did for us. That's what it's about. So as we step into this voluntarily, we're going we're gonna to sing a song here, Great Are You, Lord. It's an incredible song. Well, I love the song because it talks about his awesomeness. And the fact that he is great, he is worthy. He is worthy of us relying on him. But while we're singing the song, you've been given a card that says, I give up. And I, if you want to write on the back what it is you want to give up, that's fine. I'm not worried about that. I'm just worried about us together as a church making a commitment to give something up. And when the time comes and we're tested and we're tempted to get it, the time comes that we want it, the test time comes that we reach for it or we think about going to get it, whatever it is, and we throw James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, and we throw scripture at it, just like Jesus. And we learn and understand what it truly means to rely on Jesus for everything. So, while we sing the song, I'm just asking for you to come up and say, yep, I'm going to commit to this. I want to rely on Jesus more.
and I'm going to use this time, this moment, this voluntarily stepping into saying, yep, test me, tempt me, because I want to strengthen my relationship with you. So please stand and sing as we sing, Great Are You, Lord.
before I close this out, I forgot something and I'm sorry. There's a rose on the stage here. We've added another baby to our family. And so if you see Nicholas or Kelsey Rob, thank them, congratulate them on the birth. And I, I don't have my paper, so I don't have all the, the things, but I do know his name is Banks, because that's one of the coolest names I've ever heard, Banks. So make sure that you congratulate them and be praying for that family as they raise their children in this culture, right? Think about what you've done. You've walked up, you've said, I give up. So as you think about those things, take the next two days, memorize James chapter one, verses two through four. Memorize them so that when you go to grab whatever it is you're giving up, you can throw scripture at it. You can face the testings like Jesus. And stand firm, rely on Jesus, because that's what it's about. Thank you so much for being here next week. We are going to continue on in the I Shall Not Want series as we journey towards the cross at Easter. Have a great week. And don't forget, right after is our meeting.